Hello there, my fellow ancient undead Egyptian ripoffs, and welcome back to another lore video on the military of the Tomb Kings. Previously, we talked about these fellows' basic units, in the form of the skeleton warriors and the skeleton archers, and I also made a video on their rather unique so-called war constructs. These included the Necrolith Colossus, the Necrosphinx, and more. For today, I wanted to talk about another section of Tomb King units, and namely, their war beasts. Because even though they are dead, they still have a few things fitting in this category. I am your host, the Tomb King narrator for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The Tomb Swarms the tomb swarms are the reanimated husks and corpses of countless poisonous insects and other vicious creatures of the desert, brought to life to infest and protect the resting place of the tomb kings. Though long dead, the mere presence of the lich priests and the tomb kings fills their empty shells with animation, and they scuttle from their hiding places around the mortuary temples and beneath the scorched sands. The Lich Priests have long ago gained the mastery over these creatures, and can summon them forth at will through their magical incantations. Thus, when the Tomb King's legions stride to war, they are accompanied by the scuttling swarm that spreads across the land in a black tide of crawling bodies. Those foolish enough to stand against a Tomb Swarm will drown beneath an unstoppable wave of undead beetles biting, glowing, and burying themselves in the warmth of living flesh. Victims gasping for air or crying out in fear are quickly silenced, as a deluge of insects surge down their screaming throats, muffling cries of pain as they are devoured from the inside out. Flashbacks from the movie The Mummy intensify. The tomb swarms are drawn to the magic animating the undead, but it is to the lich priests and the tomb kings that they are most keenly attracted. Not possessing a spirit of their own, they are easily controlled by the implacable will of the Tomb Kings and their strongest servants. Left to their own devices, they revert to an instinctive lurking behavior, making them ideal gods for the pyramids of the slumbering Tomb Kings. Trespassers foolish enough to dislodge a capstone will find themselves quickly overwhelmed by a surging swarm of bugs. They are drawn to the warm blood of the living, trying to feed a hunger that no amount of flesh can ever sate. The victims of a tomb swarm, poisoned by hundreds of bites and stings, are rapidly devoured by the vicious creatures as they quickly consume their flesh, clothing, and bone alike. Of all the dead creatures that make up the bulk of a tomb swarm, there are two of them with special significance in ancient Nehekaran society. The flesh-eating, skull-carapaced Kepra beetles were believed to be the messengers of Usirion, god of the underworld. They were his agents in the mortal world, and through their eyes would Usirion know the sins of all man. It was whispered that those who displeased Usirion were punished in death. Forbidden to enter the golden paradise of the afterlife, they were instead condemned to the lowest depths of the netherworld, where a hive of Kepra beetles would burrow into their immortal bodies and gnaw on their insides for all eternity. The other important creature was the black-clawed desert scorpion. The scorpion is the form chosen by Sokht, the god of treachery and murderers. Ancient Akarans believed that a scorpion would not sting one of Sokht's murderous followers, so those accused of killing another person were pushed into a pit of scorpions. If somehow the victim managed to survive his trial by scorpion and drag himself out of the pit, then it was taken as a sign that they were indeed favored by Sokht, and therefore guilty of their initial crime. The punishment for that was death by being thrown into a pit of snakes. Those who perished died in agony as scorpion venom coursed through their veins, but at least the others believed they were innocent. There can be no escape from a tomb swarm, for the size of the creatures is such that they can crawl through the smallest of gaps without any hindrance. They can easily travel under the shifting sands of Nehekara's desert, and burrow beneath the feet of their unsuspecting prey. Without any warning, a tomb swarm can erupt through cracks in the ground, dragging their victims, kicking and screaming beneath the sands with the sheer weight of their scuttling bodies. The Giant Tomb Scorpion 
Tomb scorpions are powerful creations of the mortuary cult, formed from a combination of stone, metal, lacquered wood, and fused bone. Burrowing beneath the surface of the desert, they attack suddenly and without warning, exploding into the fray in a shower of sand. They are lethal foes, for a tomb scorpion tail carries a potent sting that can incapacitate the largest of foes, and they have powerful pincers that can slice a man in half in a moment. As they scuttle forward on eight segmented legs, they can hack apart anything in their path. The tomb scorpions are carved and molded into the representations of the giant mythical scorpions, which are said to guard the entrance to the Nehekaran underworld. These fabled creatures are said to protect the realm of souls from the predations of dark demons, who want to feed upon the spirits of the tomb kings. The tomb scorpions also serve as sarcophagi, for the shell of each construct is formed around the cadaverous body of an ancient lich priest. Although the lich priests are unable to die a natural death, many have perished through wounds sustained in battle. Those that fall are embalmed and interred within a tomb scorpion. Canopic jars containing their vital organs, or what withered remains are left of them, are embedded within the scorpion tombs in a ritualistic pattern that symbolizes death. However, some remnant of the spirit of a lich priest always remains trapped within their mummified corpses. Through incantations, these embers are rekindled, infusing the inanimate shells of the tomb scorpions with power. This magical source also provides tomb scorpions with a degree of protection against the spells of enemy wizards, whose sorcerous bolts of power unravel and fade, as they are absorbed harmlessly into the undead construct carapace. Each scorpion-shaped sarcophagus is inscribed with hieroglyphs of preservation, and a ceremony of awakening is spoken by a lich priest to animate them. If the ritual was performed correctly, the tomb scorpion will become infused with the residual power of the corpse within it. The ritual is very complex, and lasts from moonrise until the first rays of dawn. The slightest mistake or mispronunciation can have dire consequences indeed. A swarm of undead scorpions may burst out of the desert and sting the lich priest to death, or desert spirits may turn the wizard's body inside out and feast on the withered remains. In the best case scenario, the ritual will fail, and it must be recited from the very beginning. Occasionally, despite every syllable being uttered correctly, some of these ancient ones no longer respond to the incantations of awakening. That these constructs are truly dead is doubtful, as a spark of power can be felt radiating from their carapaces. Rather, it is thought that by binding these souls to the mortal plane, the Lich Priest cheated the god of the underworld out of his rightful due. Thus, it is believed that this jealous deity is not always willing to give up his long-awaited prizes by allowing the spirits of the Lich Priests to leave the realm of souls. When the Tomb Kings go to war, the Lich Priests send out their magical call and summon the Tomb Scorpions into wakefulness. The scorpions that respond to the incantations will travel for leagues beneath the sand, before clawing their way to the surface and falling upon the enemy with razor-sharp claws and stinging tail. And finally for today, the carrion. According to inscriptions, the carrion were sacred beasts, agents of Walat, the vulture-headed god of scavengers who bore the spirits of lost warriors to the sky to fight in endless battles against the demons of darkness. This belief led to the mortuary cult burying corpses of carrion in the necropolises, entombing thousands of them within the pyramids of the tomb kings from the time of Nekev I, who claimed to be the first ruler to use carrion in his army of eternity and onwards. From these ancient corpses, the carrion would once again fly across the skies of Nehekara to feast once again. The carrion resemble black desert vultures inhabiting the plains of Nehekara, but they are far bigger and more dangerous. The carrion are repulsive scavengers who stand taller than a man and have vast wingspans. They have bodies decayed and bloated by death. Putrefied ropes of muscle hang from their frames as they fly with slow, sorrowful strokes of tattered wings. Bones poke through the rotted skin of the carrion, and gashes in their distended bellies often expose the skeletal contents of their last rotting meal. 
The carrion are bold-headed creatures, and in life they would push their long necks deep into their prey's bodies, emerging slick with blood and viscera. They have razor-sharp beaks used to rip the flesh from their victims and crack bones for the marrow inside. The feet of the scavengers are tipped with viciously hooked claws, which can rend and tear their prey apart with frightening ease. The carrion will feast on the flesh of anything they can find. They are not fussy eaters, and they will gorge themselves on freshly slaughtered corpses and cadavers which had festered for far too long under the sun. Because of their immense size, the carrion will also prey upon the living. When they hunger for live prey, they prefer to hunt the wounded and the weakened, for in life they were notoriously cowardly birds, hesitant to battle foes that were able to fight back. When the victims are outnumbered and isolated, however, their ravenous hunger overcomes their craven nature, and with a hissing cry, they swoop down upon the enemy, eviscerating them with flurried swipes of their talons. The carrion used to live in the mountains east of Nehekara, and also the deserts of the west. Huge numbers of the carrion also nested in the towers and spires of Nehekara's tomb cities. After a great battle, with the slain strewn over the stricken field of war, the carrion descended to feed in entire flocks, so vast they blotted out the light of the sun. At the will of the lich priest, these revered avian creatures are imbued with magical essence and once again take to the sky, their horrifying forms spreading fear among those who feel the chill of their shadow. Fortunately, as the revered birds eventually became extinct, only those that were entombed remained. Once awakened from the slumber of death, the carrion never again returns to rest within the tombs and vaults of the pyramids. Indeed, they soar above the lands of Nehekara as they did in life, never tiring in their search for prey. These ugly creatures learned a long time ago that when armies clash, they leave behind a swathe of corpses in their wake. And so, when the tomb kings go to war, they are accompanied by great flocks of carrion circling high above. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the war beast of the tomb king armies for today. Maybe not as fancy or pretty as their war constructs like the Hyrosphinx or the Necrolith Colossus, but still efficient and deadly regardless. Are any of the creatures discussed today among your favorite Tomb King units? Which one do you like or dislike the most, and why? Feel free to share your opinion and thoughts in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. And to stay more up to date with my videos, you can click the bell notification icon too. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all an awesome day. Sigmar's blessings be upon you.